In North Carolina, a Marine's estranged wife disappears without a trace. With no body and little physical evidence, naval investigators struggle to determine her fate. The remains of a young woman are found burning near a rural South Carolina road. For five years, her identity and that of her killer remain a mystery. In Virginia, a sailor in the United States Navy is found murdered in a vacant lot. Investigators must look among his shipmates to find the killer. Violence is an inescapable reality of contemporary life. And Navy sailors and U.S. Marines are not beyond its reach. When those who defend their country commit murder, it falls to special agents of the Naval Criminal Investigative Service to ensure that no one escapes military justice. Carolina's Camp Lejeune is one of America's largest training grounds for the U.S. Marine Corps. But even here, where honor and loyalty are virtues, betrayal and murder exist. On March 27, 1999, Marine Corps Sergeant Whitman Wallace reported his estranged wife, 25-year-old Tanya, missing to military police. Though he and Tanya were separated, their four-year-old daughter had been staying with him for a few days. Tanya was supposed to pick her up after she got off work the previous evening. But she never showed. Tanya's roommates hadn't seen her either, and they said that her vehicle was also missing. Whitman believed Tanya had run off with another man. The case was turned over to the Naval Criminal Investigative Service, or NCIS, an elite civilian federal law enforcement organization whose mission is to protect and serve the Navy and Marine Corps and their families. Special Agent Robert Bratton, who headed up the major case response team, began the investigation into Tanya Wallace's disappearance. There were some very real concerns about uh, a mother of a four-year-old child who was very close to her child leaving uh, without any uh, comment to the family that she was staying with at the time. A few hours after the missing persons report was filed, word came in that Tanya's abandoned car had been found. Security guards at a nearby store had noticed it sitting in the parking lot since early that morning. An examination of the vehicle's exterior revealed the presence of small traces of human blood on the door handle. Agents and military police quickly spread out and began scouring the area for any signs of the young mother. But hours of searching failed to produce any clues to the missing woman's whereabouts. The vehicle was impounded for a more detailed analysis. Agents had to consider that with an impending divorce, Tanya Wallace might have gone missing on purpose. Looking for answers, agents went to check out her apartment and interview her roommates. One confirmed that recently Tanya had begun dating another man, but he was in the Navy and was currently deployed overseas. Tanya had made no mention of plans to travel. And since ending her relationship with the abusive Whitman Wallace, nothing seemed to be troubling her. The roommate added that since her split with Wallace, Tanya had become upbeat and excited about the new life she had ahead of her. 
she was committed to her daughter's happiness. And her roommate could not believe that Tanya would simply abandon her four-year-old, leaving her estranged husband to raise her. Based on interviews of her girlfriend that she was living with, uh, the fact that she had never uh, left the child alone for any period of time, in fact, was uncomfortable leaving uh, her child with uh, the father for any extended periods of time. Uh, we relatively quickly ruled out the, the idea that she had probably left with somebody willingly. Yeah, I'll take the Before call. leaving, the agents collected Two Tanya's brushes. toothbrush and a hairbrush for future DNA comparisons. Though agents remained hopeful that Tanya Wallace would turn up unharmed, all the signs were pointing to foul play. But so far, they had no physical proof that a crime had taken place. Okay. Right, I appreciate you coming down and talk to me. No problem. Sergeant Whitman Wallace was brought in for questioning. He insisted he had nothing to do with Tanya's disappearance. Though they couldn't seem to make their marriage work, he still loved her and their four-year-old daughter. He said that on the night Tanya disappeared, he had been assigned to work desk duty from 11 p.m. until early the next morning. He said he never left his post. Agents contacted Wallace's assistant, who also worked that evening. He confirmed that Wallace began his shift at 11 o'clock. But 30 minutes later, Wallace asked him to watch his desk. Wallace said his wife hadn't shown up to pick up their daughter, and he needed to go back home and look after her until Tanya arrived. Wallace left and eventually returned two hours later. Agents realized that Sergeant Wallace had lied when he claimed he never left work that night. Now, they needed to find out what he was trying to hide. They turned to the only piece of physical evidence they had. A week after she was reported missing, NCIS Special Agent and Forensic Consultant Mike Maloney began examining Tanya's vehicle. As soon as we opened the door, it was obvious that there was a great deal of blood in the car. It couldn't be seen from the outside. The interior of the vehicle was, or, was very dark, uh, dark colored carpet, dark colored uh, seats and interior. But once we opened the door, it was apparent that there was blood. The carpet revealed a large blood stain approximately 16 inches long and 13 inches wide. Examiners removed it for a more detailed analysis. The DNA profile of the blood found in the vehicle matched those generated from the samples collected from Tanya's residence. Hey, Bob. It was clear that something violent had happened to Tanya. But without a body, agents were unable to prove that she was dead. Special Agent Mike Maloney devised a blood volume analysis experiment that could provide them with that proof. We felt that we could show that she had lost so much blood in that vehicle that she couldn't possibly be alive. Agent Maloney first needed to determine how much blood it would take to create the same size stains as those left on the vehicle's carpet. They obtained carpet samples from the vehicle manufacturer and saturated them with human blood. Examiners determined that 1,850 milliliters of human blood, or nearly four pints, was necessary to create a similar size stain and that would be nearly half of Tanya Wallace's total blood volume. No one could have survived such severe bleeding without medical assistance. For agents, there was now no doubt that Tanya Wallace was dead. And they were equally convinced that her estranged husband 
Sergeant Whitman Wallace was responsible. But so far, they had no hard evidence to prove murder. With no body and only a blood-stained carpet to work with, forensic examiners of the Naval Criminal Investigative Service proved that missing 25-year-old Tanya Wallace was dead. I'm gonna you and the NCIS special agents believed her estranged husband, Marine Corps Sergeant Whitman Wallace, had killed her. But they lacked physical proof. And Wallace was no longer cooperating. Believing the suspect may have tried to throw away evidence of his guilt, agents began searching the dumpsters surrounding Wallace's barracks. But the trash had already been emptied. NCIS Special Agent Robert Bratton refused to give up. Though it seemed like a long shot, he contacted the area landfill where all of the trash from the Camp Lejeune dumpsters is brought. They can tell you where trash that's picked up and delivered that day or any particular day is within just a few feet. We asked them at that point to isolate the uh, trash that was delivered on Monday and Tuesday of that week. The Marines Chemical Biological Incidents Response Force located that spot and began sifting through the mountain of debris. After hours of searching, the team found and collected a large green military issue sweatshirt and some women's clothes. All of the items were covered with what appeared to be blood stains. DNA tests on the items of clothing showed that all of the blood had originated from Tanya Wallace. And for Special Agent Mike Maloney, it appeared that Tanya had been wearing the clothing at the time of her death, except for one item, the green sweatshirt. We were curious as to who the sweatshirt belonged to, though. The staining was on the outside of the sweatshirt and saturated to the inside, so we were fairly certain it wasn't something that Tanya was wearing the night that she was killed. We examined the neckband of the sweatshirt and also the armpits. And there was quite a bit of uh, debris of uh, old skin cells of sweat and sweat saturation. Examiners were able to extract minute traces of DNA from the skin cells found on the sweatshirt. Analysis showed that the DNA was consistent with having come from Sergeant Whitman Wallace. Believing they were closing in on Tanya's killer, agents searched Wallace's barracks room. Wallace was in the process of moving out, and the place had been thoroughly cleaned. Uh, I don't know what that turned out to be. When agents applied luminol and darkened the room, large stains emerged on the tile floor. Right. Yeah. Tests confirmed that the blood was human. But the stain stopped abruptly where the carpet began. No blood was present beyond the tile flooring. Convinced Tanya had been murdered inside Whitman Wallace's barracks room, agents began interviewing other Marines who lived in the same complex. Thanks. What do you have for him? One Marine recalled that a few days after Tanya was reported missing, Wallace paid him a visit. And, uh, it's, probably, it's probably no big deal. Appreciate it, man. You know how much I appreciate this. He said that he had an inspection coming up, and the carpet in his room was muddy, and it would never pass. Wallace asked to switch the carpets, and the barracks maid agreed. But after the inspection was complete, Wallace never returned to switch the rugs back. Appreciate it. Look, I'll give you a call, all right? All right, later on, okay. In fact, it was still lying on the Marine's floor. You have his rug now. Yeah. Hoping the rug contained the evidence they needed to prove Whitman Wallace was a killer, agents collected it and brought it to the lab for testing. 
got it. Agent Maloney examined the carpet. We did the luminol test, and we found the rest of the missing pattern from that stain by the door. They matched together perfectly, just like a puzzle piece, a very large saturation stain of what was later positively identified as blood on the carpet that matched that pattern that had been so sharply cut off on the tile floor. DNA testing revealed that the blood on the rug, as well as the blood on the tile floor, was consistent with Tanya's. Agents now had enough evidence to make their case. Sergeant Whitman Wallace was placed under arrest and charged with murder. Based on the evidence, agents believed that Whitman Wallace was unwilling to give up custody of his daughter and was resentful of having to pay child support. On March 26, 1999, after getting off work, Tanya went to her estranged husband's barracks to pick up her daughter. Whitman Wallace had made sure he would be there when she arrived. With the couple's four-year-old daughter asleep in the next room, Wallace savagely beat Tanya to death. He put her bleeding body into her vehicle, drove to a remote site, and buried her. At a general court-martial, Sergeant Whitman Wallace pled guilty to kidnapping and unpremeditated murder. He was sentenced to 30 years in prison. And as part of the plea agreement, Wallace led authorities to Tanya's remains. Even without the victim's body, NCIS special agents were able to quickly expose the deadly violence of a Marine Corps sergeant. But in South Carolina, it would take naval investigators years to unravel one killer's deadly scheme. On November 6th, 1989, a man driving along an isolated road in Jasper County, South Carolina, noticed something burning on the side of the road. Fearing it could spark a larger fire, he went to extinguish it. The fire was emanating from a large green duffel bag. And inside the bag, the man saw what appeared to be the charred remains of a human body. He called 911. Deputies from the Jasper County Sheriff's Office raced to the scene. The person found inside the duffel bag was burned beyond recognition and the skull had been smashed. The only clue to the victim's identity was a unicorn print nightgown that had survived the blaze, indicating this person was likely female. According to Jasper County Detective Sam Woodward, investigators found little else. Only thing we had was a, a female body in a duffel bag that was set afire. Um, basically, that's all we had. We didn't have no footprints, uh, no tire tracks, nothing like that. Believing that the victim's identity would reveal her killer, police hoped an autopsy hey, would yield valuable information. The weight, 165, 165. Analysis of the remains led the medical examiner to conclude that the female victim was Caucasian, around 25 years old, with dark brown hair. An enlarged uterus indicated that she had recently given birth. Her death had been brutal. She had been hit in the head 32 times with a blunt instrument. Police entered what little information they had into a national law enforcement database containing descriptions of missing persons. They also checked all local missing persons reports. But none of the reports matched the description of this Jane Doe. Authorities knew their only hope of identifying this victim was to reconstruct her face as it had been in life. For help, 
police called upon the expertise of Dr. Ted Rathbun, professor of anthropology at the University of South Carolina. He quickly realized this task would not be easy. In a complete human skull, there are 22 separate bones of the skull and face. But in this instance, due to the massive trauma, there were at least 122 fragments to deal with. Some as large as the palm of your hand, others as small as half of your little fingernail. So that it really was a jigsaw puzzle, a three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle. After eight days, Dr. Rathbun had successfully rebuilt the skull. I was able to provide law enforcement and the forensic artists with a completed skull that was held together with glue, with uh, supporting sticks and clay, uh, so that photographs could be taken and oriented, uh, representing an individual with a distinctive facial structure. Okay. Forensic artist Roy Paschal of the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division was brought in. It was now up to him to bring this victim to life. Uh, we do have that high breed. After placing rubber markers at certain points in the skull to indicate the depth of the flesh, Pascal photographed the evidence. Then he began drawing the face of the victim by hand in pencil. Four months after her body was found, Jane Doe finally had a face. Hoping to spark some recognition from the public, the victim's image was distributed throughout the area to the media and to local law enforcement agencies. But no leads were developed. Five years went by without a break in the investigation. It began to look as if this case would never be solved. For investigators, it seemed that the identity of Jane Doe and that of her killer would remain a mystery. For nearly five years, a female victim found burning along a Jasper County, South Carolina road remained unidentified. Although forensic examiners had given Jane Doe a face, her name and the circumstances surrounding her death remained a mystery. Go one time. Years of searching through missing persons reports failed to produce a match. It's just one of those things, just... And by 1993, missing persons cases filed in South Carolina had reached an all-time high. But the rash of reported cases was not limited to the civilian population. Agents from the Naval Criminal Investigative Service stationed in Charleston were also inundated with similar cases involving military personnel and members of their families. Though they had formed a cold case squad to deal with the volume, their caseload continued to increase. In October of 1993, agents responded to the home of Kathy French. Her lifelong friend, 28-year-old Annie Tahan, hadn't been heard from in nearly five years. At the time of her disappearance, Annie had been living with her boyfriend, Michael Palan, a sailor stationed in Charleston. And though Annie and Michael had had a child together in 1989, their relationship had been troubled. Just after Annie became pregnant, Michael grew violent and abusive toward her. He would explode into a rage for no particular reason and threaten to leave her and take their baby with him. Annie began to fear for her life, but she vowed she would never give up her child. A short while later, Kathy moved out of state. And after giving birth to her baby, Annie wanted to join her 
but was reluctant because Michael Pallan had had her arrested once before on bogus kidnapping charges. A few months later, Annie called her. She was ready to leave Charleston with her baby and come stay with Kathy. Kathy said she wired Annie money for bus fare, but never heard from her again. Since the father of the missing woman's child was a sailor in the United States Navy, NCIS Special Agent Jim Grebus agreed to open an investigation. But given the couple's tumultuous relationship, he had to consider that Annie's disappearance had been intentional. Uh, we felt that maybe she um, was in a bad relationship with Michael Pallon and that she could have just fled. And um, that, that was a possibility we had to rule out. A records check showed that electronics warfare okay, chief Michael Pallon was currently stationed at a naval base in Hawaii. She said. Agent Grievous contacted agents there and asked them to speak with Pallon. Chief Pallon. Michael Pallon told the agents that on the morning of November 6, 1989, he woke to find that Annie had left him and the baby. He remembered that she'd called a few days later, but didn't say where she was or what her plans were. He hadn't heard from her since. Pallon added that his mother, who currently lived in Savannah, Georgia, had since adopted their daughter. Naval investigators didn't believe Pallon's story. For them, there was only one explanation as to why Annie Tehan was not with her baby. We felt that if she was going to leave, what she wanted to do, she would have taken that child. That was the one thing she wanted was to take that child with her. She did not want to lose that child. It didn't take uh, us very long to form the opinion that she had, uh, she had been um, murdered. Agents believe that Michael Pallan had killed Annie Tehan. But so far, they had no proof. They began reviewing dozens of unsolved murder cases from throughout the state. In one of the files, dating back to 1989, Agent Grievous made a startling discovery. That was a forensic a drawing of a young lady that had been found in Jasper County on November 6th of 1989. And I took this photograph I had of Annie, and I, I looked at both of them, and I knew right then that this was Annie and that we had just found her. DNA analysis confirmed that the mysterious Jane Doe was in fact Annie Tehan. And now, Naval Chief Michael Pallan was the prime suspect in her murder investigation. Well, I went up to sled yesterday and I met with but NCIS Special Agent Peter Hughes knew that finding proof of his guilt would be difficult. The problem we were confronted with was the fact that we were working a homicide case six years after the fact. So to um, start from ground zero and try and put these facts together was going to be a tremendous hurdle for all of us. The results for the credit card. Agents and local authorities began by trying to retrace Pallan's movements at the time of the murder. In Hardyville. They sifted through his phone records for November 6, 1989. They found several calls placed to a number in Savannah, Georgia, located 100 miles away. The number belonged to Pallan's ex-wife. Unsure of the connection, local police obtained her financial records. They found a receipt dated November 6th from a gas station located 25 miles from where Annie's body was discovered. Investigators began to theorize that Michael Pallan had not acted alone. Agents traveled to Miami, where Pallan's ex-wife currently lived. Though she denied any knowledge of Annie's murder, she remembered that one morning in mid-November 1989, Pallan called her. He said that Annie had recently left him and he needed her to help take care of the baby. She agreed and drove to Pallan's apartment in Charleston a day or two later to pick up the child. 
but the phone records and gas receipts proved that she had traveled to the apartment on November 6th, the same day Annie was murdered. When it came to dates and times, she couldn't seem to keep her story straight. Agents confronted her with the receipts and asked if they would help refresh her memory. Once she realized we knew she was in that apartment uh, at about the time that, that Annie was murdered, um, she knew we had her. Knowing she could be implicated in the murder, the ex-wife agreed to cooperate. She said that Michael Pallan didn't want Annie in his life anymore, but wanted the couple's baby. Knowing Annie would never give up her child, Pallan plotted to kill her. And the ex-wife agreed to help him pull it off. In the early morning hours of November 6th, Pallan called her and told her it was done and he needed her help in cleaning up the apartment. When she arrived just after dawn, she noticed blood everywhere. After helping Pallan load Annie's body into the trunk of his car, she helped him shampoo the carpets and paint over the blood spatter on the walls. The information had brought agents one step closer to making their case. Now they needed to find physical proof that Michael Pallan had done what his ex-wife had accused him of. She agreed to take agents to Pallan's old apartment and walk them through the crime scene. Though the apartment was now vacant, the ex-wife was able to point out where Annie's body had been on the carpet. She also described the pattern of blood spatter on the walls and ceiling. But no blood was visible. And after so many years, agents were skeptical they would find any. Still, agents darkened the room and applied luminol throughout the area. To their surprise, blood was still present the locations of all the stains were exactly where the ex-wife said they would be. Though the findings had corroborated the ex-wife's statements and provided powerful evidence of Pallan's guilt, agents knew it didn't prove beyond a reasonable doubt that he was the killer. Because when you look at the facts of the case, a defense attorney can easily say that this was a jealous wife who killed her, not Pallan, but a jealous wife. Agents needed to get Michael Pallan to confess to the murder. With the ex-wife's help, agents set a trap. She would phone Pallan and coax him into talking about the murders. Interesting enough, the opening comment that his ex-wife made was, uh, Michael, they found the body. They found Annie. And his reply was, no, they didn't, which um, was, was of major significance in that he, an innocent person, of course, is gonna say, what are you talking about, body? I don't know, what, what are you talking about? But now he's, he's on the phone and he's telling us, no, the police didn't find the body. Got him to talk about after several days of intercepting phone calls, agents had heard enough. Well, did you hear him deny? Uh, Tell it. Three weeks before he was scheduled to retire from the Navy, Chief Michael Pallan was placed under arrest and charged with the murder of Annie Tahan. Confronted with the evidence amassed against him, Pallan confessed to the crime. Determined to keep his child, he said in the early morning hours of November 6th, he returned home from work to find Annie sleeping in front of the TV. Using a blunt instrument, he beat her to death. To conceal his guilt, he placed Annie's body in a duffel bag and drove to a deserted country road. 
He threw gasoline on the body and lit it on fire. At a general court-martial convened at the Naval Station in Mayport, Florida, Michael Pallan pled guilty to the premeditated murder of Annie Tahan. He was sentenced to 30 years at the Leavenworth Federal Prison. We asked for comparisons. Betrayal by a husband or a wife has become all too common. This, this is our girl. Or somewhere along the way. But military buddies claim to be loyal friends to the end. Much in the eyes. On the morning of April 23, 1998, a man pulling up weeds near an apartment complex in Newport News, Virginia, noticed something lying in the grass. When he approached, he saw that it was a human body, and the male victim had been shot to death. The man went to a nearby apartment and called 911. Officers from the Newport News Police Department responded to the scene. They began searching the victim's pockets for any clues to his identity. Inside a wallet, they found several hundred dollars in cash and an ID card. The victim was 23-year-old Stephen November, a sailor stationed aboard an aircraft carrier at the nearby Norfolk Naval Base. He had been shot five times. But the lack of any stray bullets or shell casings at the scene, combined with scuff marks observed on the victim's shoes, led police to believe that Stephen November had been murdered elsewhere, then brought to this remote location. No one who lived in the area had seen or heard anything unusual. At autopsy, the medical examiner determined that the cause of death was a 9mm gunshot wound to the victim's head. Four other bullets, recovered from November's head and chest, appear to have been fired from the same weapon. But with few clues and no solid suspects, police knew that finding this young sailor's killer would be a difficult challenge. Police in Newport News, Virginia, continued searching for answers in the shooting death of 23-year-old Stephen November, an enlisted sailor in the United States Navy. With little physical evidence to go on, police hoped a search of his residence would yield some clues. Police scoured November's records. One document caught their attention. It was a transaction record in Stephen November's name for a 9mm handgun the same type of gun that had been used to kill him. But a thorough search of the apartment failed to produce the weapon. Looking to uncover any information, detectives contacted the victim's commanding officers at the Norfolk Naval Base. But nothing in November's records suggested any problems. He was a dedicated sailor and was well liked by his shipmates. Hoping to retrace November's movements on the night he was murdered, detectives arranged to interview his friends and shipmates. Airman apprentice Hector Coleman said he and another friend were with November the night before his body was discovered. The three had gone out to run a few errands that evening. Around 10 o'clock, November asked the driver, Carlos Saldana, to drop him off at a nearby convenience store. November said he had some things to do, and he would meet up with them later. He had just cashed a large tax refund check and was carrying over $2,000 in cash.
the two men watched November enter the store and then drove away. It's a cool guy. I mean, cool guy. Coleman said they never saw their friend after that. But, all right, that's it. For nothing is yet. There's something outside. Airman recruit Carlos Saldana, who had been driving the car that night, was also interviewed. How'd it go? He told the same story as Hector Coleman. But almost immediately, police sensed that Saldana was not telling the truth. Newport News homicide detective Lorenzo Shepard observed the questioning. Uh, while he was being questioned, he was, appeared to be very nervous. Uh, he was very fidgety. Uh, he wouldn't look you directly in the eye, and those normally are, sound, are signs of individuals who are being deceptive or not being truthful uh, when discussing something. Sure. Detectives asked Saldana to take a polygraph test. When the results indicated deception, he decided to talk. Saldana said the three had gone to the convenience store that night, but they did not leave after November went inside. About 30 seconds. The victim got into the back seat of the car a few minutes later, and they drove away. He said Hector Coleman then pulled out a 9mm gun and shot Stephen November. The motive behind the murder, according to Saldana, was robbery. Saldana had no idea where the murder weapon currently was, but he knew that the gun belonged to Stephen November. Carlos Saldana and Hector Coleman were both placed under arrest and charged with murder. Coleman denied any involvement in the shooting. With Saldana's confession, police believed they had an airtight case. But a month before the case was scheduled to go to trial, an inmate serving time with Saldana in the city jail came forward with information. I've already been here for three months. I don't, uh, everybody. Carlos Saldana had bragged that he was the one who actually murdered Stephen November. He told the inmate that he had pinned it on Hector Coleman in order to avoid the death penalty. The inmate had provided reliable information in the past, and police had no reason to doubt him now. Investigators' strongest witness had confessed to being the trigger man. And now, a month before the trial, they were back to square one. Investigators knew that one of the two men in custody was responsible for Stephen November's murder. But until they could prove who had pulled the trigger, they knew they could never win a conviction. Police in Newport News, Virginia, had two enlisted men in custody for the murder of Stephen November, a 23-year-old Navy sailor found shot to death in a vacant lot. Though Carlos Saldana told police that his friend Hector Coleman was the killer, Saldana later admitted to an inmate that he had actually pulled the trigger. Shot. With the trial just weeks away, investigators were now in danger of losing their case. But they had another option, one that would allow investigators more time to build a solid case. Newport News authorities dropped all of the charges against Hector Coleman and Carlos Saldana and turned the case over to prosecutors of the Navy's Judge Advocate General Corps, referred to as JAG, who shared jurisdiction in the investigation. JAG officer Lieutenant Commander Scott Lang took the case. And with little physical evidence, he had to prove which of the two witnesses was telling the truth. The challenges in this case were that we had only two witnesses, and both of them had a huge motive to lie. Uh, no one wants to get pinned with being the actual trigger man in a murder. So we did not want to commit our prosecutorial efforts to any one theory uh, based solely on the word of someone with a motive to lie. For help, Lieutenant Commander Lang turned to special agents of the Naval Criminal Investigative Service located in Norfolk, Virginia. Well, I just want to give everybody a brief here. Agent Bill Heath was assigned the case. 
His first step was to determine the truthfulness of Carlos Saldana's claim that Hector Coleman committed the murder inside his vehicle. We wanted to go back to that vehicle and determine the feasibility of Mr. Saldana's statement. Could this shooting have occurred in this vehicle as he described? That was, that was their primary objective. Is it possible? An initial inspection of the vehicle, however, revealed no visible traces of blood or any other signs of violence. The search of Saldana's vehicle was turning up nothing. And it seemed that agents' best chance of exposing Stephen November's killer was slipping away. But NCIS forensic examiners are trained to look past the obvious. Special Agent Mike Maloney removed the rear seat of the vehicle where Stephen November had allegedly been sitting when the murder occurred. When he split the seat cushions open, he found the underlying foam cushion soaked in blood. DNA analysis confirmed that the blood stains had come from Stephen November's body. Using a projectile trajectory analysis, Agent Maloney now set out to prove where the shots had come from. Projectile trajectory analysis is a method by which you take the injuries or the wounds that occur to the individual and also any intermediate targets that the bullet may have passed through, be it the clothing, be it the seat itself, um, a wall, a window, and by lining those up, you're able to determine where the likely point of origin of that shot was. A mannequin with Stephen November's bullet-ridden shirt was placed in the back seat of Saldana's car. Using the blood stains in the seat cushion to approximate the victim's position, Agent Maloney concluded that the path of the bullets must have originated from the front passenger seat. Since Carlos Saldano was known to be the driver the night of the murder, agents could assume that Hector Coleman had occupied the front passenger seat position. But for Special Agent Heath, that was not enough. He needed to locate the murder weapon, which he believed was Stephen November's missing 9mm gun. A short while after entering the serial number into a national law enforcement database, he got a call. Police in Brooklyn, New York, had arrested a man on a burglary charge, and in his possession was Stephen November's 9mm handgun. When the gun was recovered, I was uh, extremely happy that, that we had found that proverbial needle in a haystack. The next hurdle was determining, is this the murder weapon or not? After ballistics tests confirmed that November's gun had fired the fatal shots, Agent Heath traveled to New York to find out how the gun got there. The man in custody claimed he bought the gun from a friend of his. Reluctantly, he provided agents with the name and number of the seller. Agents contacted the man who had sold the gun. Fearing for his own safety, he agreed to talk but only in a secluded spot at a nearby park. When shown photographs of the suspects, he pointed to Hector Coleman, an old childhood friend, as the man who sold him the 9mm gun. Coleman told his friend that he had used the gun to commit a murder, and now he needed to get rid of it. Once I was able to locate the witness in New York that actually purchased this 9mm from Mr. Coleman, his testimony became absolutely tremendous because here we have a disinterested third party who, in a casual conversation with Mr. Coleman, was given all the details of the crime. Though agents have no idea why Carlos Saldana had bragged to an inmate that he had pulled the trigger, they had proven that Hector Coleman had murdered Stephen November. Agents believe that before entering the convenience store, November asked his friend Hector Coleman to hold on to his 9mm gun. After driving away, Coleman said he wanted to fire the gun into the air. He asked November to make sure there were no police around. 
when the young sailor turned his back, Coleman shot him. He then robbed him of nearly $2,000 in tax refund money. Then had Saldana drive to a remote location where they dumped the victim. Saldana later claimed that Coleman threatened to kill him too if he told anyone about the murder. Carlos Saldana pled guilty to one count of accessory and two counts of false official statements. He was sentenced to eight years confinement. A general court-martial was convened for Hector Coleman on August 18, 1999. He was found guilty of the robbery and murder of Stephen November. He was sentenced to life without parole in a federal prison. Violent crime poses a threat to every segment of society. But when a murder occurs within the United States Navy and Marine Corps, it falls to special agents of the Naval Criminal Investigative Service to make certain that no one escapes military justice. In Florida, a young woman is hit by a train. But what looks like a suicide might be a killer covering his tracks. A woman disappears from her Arizona home. With no body, police must rely on a few drops of blood to determine her fate. In California, police are called to the scene of a grisly double homicide. Only forensic examiners can prove whether it was the result of self-defense or cold-blooded murder. Some killers go to great lengths to manipulate a crime scene. But the truth is hard to disguise, and forensic examiners can see through the deception, especially when it's written in tainted blood. Around 4 a.m. on December 5, 1993, a freight train was passing through the small community of Crestview, Florida. On an isolated stretch, the engineer noticed something lying across the tracks up ahead. It looked like a human body. He frantically sounded the whistle and struggled to stop the train. Underneath the 120-ton train, he discovered the lifeless body of a woman. The engineer quickly radioed in for help. Within minutes, police and emergency personnel from the Crestview Police Department were dispatched to the scene. The young female victim had suffered massive head and chest wounds. She was partially covered by a black trench coat that was stained with blood. Police began searching for any form of identification to tell them who this woman was. They found nothing. Blood found pooled on the tracks and on some rocks just feet away from where the victim came to rest suggested the impact point. A few hairs and tiny drops of blood were found at the front of the train. But investigators found no blood smears on the tracks leading up to the victim's body. When questioned, the engineer told police that as he worked to stop the train, he believed that he made eye contact with the woman lying on the tracks. She never even flinched as the train approached. She just seemed to be staring at him. Before leaving the scene, evidence technicians photographed the area. Uh, 
At autopsy, the medical examiner determined the cause of death to be severe trauma to the unidentified victim's head and chest. She had suffered multiple skull fractures and a broken rib. To the medical examiner, all of the injuries were consistent with having been caused by the train. With no obvious signs of foul play noted during autopsy, investigators began looking for other explanations behind the tragedy. For Chief Maxi Barrow, there seemed to be only one. We would, were thinking that it could possibly be a suicide. It could be somebody who was depressed and laid down on the railroad track and uh, let a train run over them. To confirm their suspicions, investigators first had to identify the young woman. Several local residents believed she was 24-year-old Sherry Morrow, who lived with her husband less than a mile from the train tracks. Police went to the address. There, they were met by John Morrow, Sherry's husband, and the couple's roommate. Investigators showed the husband a photograph of the victim. John Morrow couldn't believe what he was seeing. The woman lying dead on the railroad tracks was his wife, Sherry. Morrow said that he and Sherry fought the night before. She believed he was flirting with another woman who was at a party at the couple's house. She became enraged. John followed her outside, determined to convince her that she was mistaken. They walked up the street to a payphone. She was cold, so John gave her his trench coat. Despite his efforts, Sherry remained angry and seemed depressed. John returned home, believing the best thing he could do would be to leave her alone. He thought that Sherry called a friend to come pick her up. John never imagined that she would take her own life. The couple's roommate corroborated John's story. The husband's account, in addition to the autopsy finding, left investigators with no reason to doubt the suicide theory. The investigation into Sherry Morrow's death was ready to be closed. The following day, however, Sherry Morrow's mother came in to speak with police. Okay, your, your daughter was married. She could not accept that her daughter had taken her own life. John, she said, had had numerous affairs that Sherry found out about. As a result, Sherry had decided to end the turbulent marriage. Recently, she had begun searching for her own place so she could be closer to her mother. And though Sherry was upset to learn of her husband's infidelities, her mother was certain that she would never have killed herself. In fact, Sherry was prepared for a costly divorce, which John desperately wanted to avoid. It's not unusual for uh, the family of a suicide victim to determine that or to, to say that they didn't do they didn't commit suicide but in the case in the case of this victim her mother was pretty convincing to me that uh, that that this victim didn't do that and uh, wouldn't have done that despite their new suspicions investigators found no evidence suggesting that Sherry Morrow had met with foul play Almost a month after she was discovered along the railroad tracks, the young woman was laid to rest. Over the next several years, investigators interviewed dozens of Sherry's friends looking to uncover proof that she had been murdered. But they found nothing. The investigation into Sherry Morrow's death ground to a halt. The case was handed over to Crestview Police Lieutenant Jerome Worley. 
Determined to breathe new life into the investigation, he began re-interviewing the couple's friends and associates, starting with their roommate. The roommate again corroborated the story John had given two years earlier. On the night Sherry died, he said John followed her after she stormed out of the house in anger. But he returned soon after and never left the house again. Detectives sensed that the roommate wasn't telling the truth. Under threat of prosecution, he changed his story. John, he said, was sick of his wife, and he often bragged about how easy it would be to kill her and to make her death look like a suicide or an accident. He said that on the night Sherry died, John was gone for hours after leaving with her. When he returned, John was agitated. His knuckles were red. And he told the roommate, it's done. Though the roommate's testimony confirmed investigators' suspicions that John Morrow was involved in his wife's death, Lieutenant Worley knew it wouldn't be enough to prove murder. Well, the roommate would be contradicting himself with the new statement, and it would just be his word against the husband's word in court. So we knew we'd have to have some physical evidence to prove the case. But with the victim laid to rest and little evidence recovered from the scene, finding proof of murder would not be easy. For nearly three years, police in Crestview, Florida, struggled to make sense of the death of 24-year-old Sherry Morrow. Though all of the evidence suggested she had taken her own life by lying in front of an oncoming train, investigators suspected that her husband, John Morrow, had murdered her. But they didn't have a shred of proof. Investigators forwarded what little evidence they had to the Florida Department of Law Enforcement Crime Lab in Pensacola. There, examiner Jan Johnson, an expert in bloodstain pattern interpretation, began examining photographs of the scene and the victim's clothes. Starting at the place where Sherry was struck by the train, Johnson began analyzing the bloodstains. Generally speaking, if you would have a body uh, lying on a railroad track, and the, the body's still, uh, there's no movement. So therefore, when the, the train would strike the victim, you would have spatter blood at that point of impact. But in the photographs, there was no blood spatter at that spot. The blood was pooled. For Johnson, the only way to explain the findings was that Sherry was already bleeding when she laid down on the tracks. The lack of any blood smeared along the tracks leading up to Sherry's body was also troubling. If it was a train striking a woman lying on the railroad tracks, I would expect to see a trail of blood leading from the point of impact to the final resting place. In fact, no bleeding had occurred from any of the wounds caused by the train. That would only make sense if she was dead at the point of impact. Uh, once your heart stops, uh, the blood flow ceases. So therefore, any uh, injury that occurs after that fact, uh, you will have very little uh, bloodshed. But if the train hadn't killed her, the question remained, what had? To find out, Johnson began analyzing the blood stains found on the victim's clothes. She found blood spatter on the victim's t-shirt that didn't correspond to any of the head injuries noted in the original autopsy report. The size and the location of the spatter on the t-shirt was consistent with a specific type of injury. If I had not known this was a train case and just received the clothing solely alone in the laboratory, I would have clearly thought someone had been beaten uh, just by looking at the clothing because again we've got this batter pattern on the t-shirt and this would be consistent with someone being beaten, stabbed, something of that nature. Johnson passed on her findings to Crestview Police. 
the forensic analysis convinced detectives that Sherry Morrow had been murdered. To take this case before a jury, however, they needed to find the fatal injuries that had somehow gone unnoticed years earlier. Three years after she was laid to rest, Sherry's remains were exhumed and forwarded to the medical examiner for a second autopsy. A new medical examiner began looking for evidence of homicide. On the back of the victim's skull, he found injuries consistent with blunt force trauma. And the wounds were not consistent with any of the injuries caused by the train. Medical examiner Dr. Michael Birkeland next reviewed the original autopsy photos looking for any other abnormalities. He noticed strange bruising on the victim's neck that had not been noted in the original autopsy reports. X-rays revealed the presence of a broken hyoid, a bone in the neck located at the base of the tongue. Dr. Birkeland didn't believe that the train could have caused the injury. It would be extremely unlikely that uh, the train could have struck her in such a way to fracture the hyoid and leave the jaw intact uh, because it is such a protected structure up high in the neck, uh, back behind the jawbone. The most reasonable explanation for the broken hyoid was that Sherry Morrow had been strangled. The blunt force trauma injuries found on the skull and the broken hyoid bone gave investigators the evidence they needed to prove that Sherry Morrow had been the victim of a homicide. And though investigators suspected that her husband, John Morrow, had committed the murder, they needed to find a way to link him to the crime scene. Walking in between the tracks was this couple. Though several years had gone by, police tracked down all of the railroad engineers who had passed through the area on the night Sherry was murdered one immediately recognized photographs of John and Sherry Morrow. The couple, he said, were walking dangerously close to the tracks. They appeared to be having a bitter argument and seemed oblivious to his warnings. The engineer specifically remembered that the man, identified as John Morrow, had been wearing a black trench coat. On April 29, 1997, John Morrow was placed under arrest and charged with first-degree murder. Though he maintained his innocence, police believe that when Sherry decided to end the marriage, the stress of a divorce was too much for him to bear. As the couple argued while walking along the railroad tracks, John grabbed a blunt instrument and struck Sherry in the back of the head. But when she failed to lose consciousness, he finished the job by beating and then strangling her, breaking her hyoid bone in the process. Then he laid her bleeding body on the tracks and covered her with the blood-spattered trench coat. Sherry likely died within a few minutes. A jury convicted John Morrow of murder and sentenced him to life in prison without parole. John Morrow tried to deceive investigators by disguising his victim's cause of death. In a suburban community just north of Phoenix, Arizona, investigators would have to prove murder without the victim's body. On the evening of June 4, 1989, Maricopa County Sheriff's deputies were called to the home of Earl and Ruby Morris. The couple's daughter, Cindy, was concerned that something had happened to her 49-year-old mother, Ruby. The two had made plans to meet that day, but Ruby failed to show up. When Cindy stopped by to check on her, she found her parents' bedroom was unusually messy. and she noticed that their 22 caliber handgun was missing. She said that her father, life. Earl, was currently in Los Angeles, California, but he would be back early the next day. But by the following morning, neither Ruby nor her husband, Earl, had returned home. 
Maricopa County Sheriff's Lieutenant Lee Luganbuehl was asked to look into the case. After reviewing the daughter's statements, he agreed to open a missing persons investigation. Well, the daughter, Cindy, is supposed to meet her for lunch that day, and she never showed up. And this was kind of unusual for mom. Mom was a, a very uh, prompt person, would always meet her appointments, and she was very neat around the house also. Uh, so there were some things that were out of place at the house that was just not like Ruby. Later that afternoon, the detective returned to the Morris residence to interview family members. When asked about her mother and father's relationship, Cindy told police that her parents' 30-year marriage had turned ugly in recent months. What is this, Earl? Earl had been caught having an affair. Upset and angry, Ruby began threatening to end the marriage and vowed to financially ruin her husband. Earl, a successful 49-year-old accountant, promised her that would never happen. But Cindy couldn't imagine that her father was capable of physical violence. As the questioning continued, Earl Morris returned from his trip. Cindy commented that he wasn't driving his own car. Earl explained that his car, an El Camino, had broken down some 200 miles from home on the drive back from Los Angeles. After several hours stranded on the road, he managed to hitch a ride to Phoenix Sky Harbor Airport. There, Earl said he rented a car to get home. But almost immediately, the detective was suspicious of Earl's story. I looked at his clothes and his general demeanor, too. He was neat. Uh, he didn't appear to be out, uh, you know, uh, trying to flag down a car. Uh, he was all put together. The detective also noticed new airport tags on Earl's luggage, suggesting he had flown, not driven, from California. And the luggage tags originated from San Diego, not Los Angeles. With his suspicions raised, the investigator questioned Earl about Ruby's disappearance. Though he couldn't explain why the couple's 22 caliber gun was missing, he seemed unconcerned about his wife's whereabouts. Ruby, he said, would often take off for days on end without a word. Earl told me he didn't think it was unusual uh, for Ruby to be gone. Uh, for a couple of days that, uh, you know, she had the wherewithal, credit cards, be able to go out, visit other people, and, and to leave. So he, again, was saying, like, it was no big deal that she was gone. Ten, four, two, Investigators felt differently. Looking to corroborate Earl's story, they began searching the interstates for his broken-down El Camino. But hours of driving turned up no signs of the vehicle, and there were no records of it having been towed. An APB was issued for the car. A short while later, Earl Morris's El Camino was located. It was found nearly 400 miles away, parked near the San Diego airport. San Diego authorities impounded the vehicle and arranged for it to be transported back to Arizona. All right, thanks. Bye. For investigators, it was now clear that Earl Morris's story was a lie. To find out what he was hiding, they obtained a search warrant. Later that evening, police returned to his residence. Having observed no obvious signs of foul play, investigators began scouring the bedroom for trace amounts of evidence they discovered several blood stains on the carpet near the bed. Maricopa County Sheriff's Crime Lab Supervisor James Serpa noticed something odd about their appearance. We saw visible signs that the carpet nap and the master suite had been disturbed um, in a circular pattern which could indicate the use of a uh, carpet cleaner. Technicians also found a fine mist of blood spatter on the headboard of the couple's bed. 
the evidence was collected and forwarded to the crime lab for analysis. For investigators, the discovery of so much blood was not encouraging. The amount of blood in the master suite uh, was a significant amount of blood, and someone would have been uh, at least direly wounded, if not deceased. Though investigators believed that someone was Ruby Morris, they soon learned that the blood recovered from the house was too degraded for a definitive DNA analysis. Technicians began scouring Earl Morris's vehicle for clues. The search revealed the presence of several large blood stains on the passenger side carpet. The samples were collected and sent out for DNA testing. Though the analysis would take time, police speculated that Earl Morris had murdered his wife, then transported her body in his El Camino. And that meant Ruby's body could be anywhere between Phoenix and San Diego. As investigators began the daunting task of trying to pinpoint Ruby's remains, one of the couple's daughters came forward with information. Earl owned a boat, and he kept it docked in San Diego. Believing there had to be a connection, police contacted authorities there. A few days later, San Diego Harbor Police forwarded a video cassette to Maricopa County investigators. The tape, shot the same day that Ruby was reported missing, showed a boat burning at sea. And authorities had positively identified it as belonging to Earl Morris. For detectives, the significance was clear. We speculated that Earl rented another boat to tow out his boat and actually set it on fire to hide uh, the body of, uh, of Ruby uh, and also the murder weapon at that time. The boat ultimately sank in treacherous waters too deep to be recovered. Despite the clumsy lies Earl Morris was telling police, it looked like he just might get away with murder. Detectives in Maricopa County, Arizona, were convinced that Earl Morris had murdered his 49-year-old wife, Ruby, and then entombed her in a watery grave several hundred miles away off the California coast. But without a weapon or the victim's body, they would have to rely on the forensic evidence to prove murder. And first, they would have to show that blood found in Earl's El Camino belonged to his wife. With no known samples from Ruby to compare to the evidence, examiners turned to a process called reverse paternity typing, which isolates strands of DNA that pass unchanged from mother to child. Maricopa County Sheriff's Crime Lab Supervisor James Serpa then compared the genetic profile of the samples collected from the El Camino to those generated from Ruby's two daughters and from her siblings. The blood stain on the carpet of the El Camino was the mother of Ruby's children and the sibling of Ruby's brother and sister. Though their case was largely circumstantial, investigators arrested Earl Morris and charged him with murder. Through his lawyer, Earl refused to make any statements. As the trial approached, investigators struggled to come up with more incriminating evidence against Earl Morris but they found little else. Then, word came in that Earl Morris wanted to talk. He admitted he had been lying to authorities, but he said it wasn't to cover up his wife's murder. Ruby, he said, had killed herself. Earl said that in the early morning hours of June 4th, he entered the master bedroom and found Ruby dead clutching the couple's 22 caliber pistol in her hand. Blood was everywhere. 
Wanting to spare the family the embarrassment of the suicide, he cleaned up the room and drove her body to San Diego, where he then disposed of the remains. He thought it would be easier for the family to accept that Ruby had decided to just up and leave. Though the account sounded ridiculous to police, they realized that Earl's suicide story had the potential to create reasonable doubt in the minds of jurors. Unless investigators could come up with hard evidence to prove otherwise, Earl Morris could be a free man. And without the ability to examine the victim's body, it would be difficult to disprove Earl's story. Lieutenant Commander Rod Englert, an expert in bloodstain pattern analysis, was brought in to assist in the investigation. Englert and Serpa began by re-examining the headboard collected from the couple's bedroom. When luminol was applied, Englert had no doubt that the blood spatter present, which appeared as fine mist, had resulted from a specific type of injury. Well, when there's crimes of violence, blood is categorized into three major categories. The low uh, category, which is termed low velocity impact spatters, just drops of blood, smears of blood, transfer stains. The second category is from blunt trauma, which is termed medium velocity. And the third category, which we're dealing with in this particular case, is high velocity, which is a specific, uh, easily identified uh, pattern, which is atomization of blood. And that comes from gunshot. The location of the spatter on the headboard also allowed examiners to determine the position of the victim's head at the time she was shot. Ruby had been lying flat in a sleep-like position. Though the finding was suspicious, on its own it did not contradict Earl Morris's suicide story. After thoroughly photographing the bloodstains, Englert began looking for any abnormalities in the patterns. Something immediately caught his attention. As you look at the headboard a left to right direction, you have a pattern of blood going up that direction. You have another pattern of blood over, overlapping it and going another direction. So you have there two conditions that don't occur at the same time. The blood stain patterns indicated that Ruby had been shot at least twice. And if she had taken her own life, as Earl claimed, that would have been difficult to do. Well, first of all, Ruby Morris would have to been able to cock the hammer on the gun, which I'm told was a single action revolver 22. After a shot to the head, to a large source of blood, would have to be able to cock it again, and possibly even a third time. And that's not likely. Investigators agreed. Based on the forensic analysis, there could be little doubt that Ruby Morris had been murdered. Police believe that to avoid the financial ruin from a divorce, Earl Morris chose to kill his wife. As Ruby lay sleeping in the couple's bed, he pulled out the 22 caliber pistol and shot her several times in the head. After cleaning up the crime scene, he loaded her bleeding body into his El Camino and drove several hundred miles away to San Diego. Once there, he loaded her body, and likely the murder weapon, onto his boat. He set the craft on fire returned to shore and began the process of covering up his crime. With the help of Rod Englert's blood spatter analysis, Earl Morris was convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison. Earl Morris tried to explain his wife's death by creating a story about suicide. But sometimes murderers admit killing their victims and the story they tell investigators is one of self-defense. Around 1.30 a.m. on October 18, 1984, 
the Sacramento County Sheriff's Department received a frantic 911 call. 24-year-old Brett Harris said that his mother, Barbara, had been murdered. His stepfather, Bob Giesler, was also dead. Distraught, Brett was threatening to take his own life. Sacramento County Sheriff's deputies raced to the scene. As they approached the house, they made a bizarre discovery. A man, identified as Brett Harris, was hiding in a tree. After talking him down, one of the officers made his way into the residence. Come on over here. Come on out. In the master bedroom, he discovered a gruesome scene. A woman lay dead on the mattress. And on the floor nearby was another lifeless body. Officers from the Sacramento County Sheriff's Department were dispatched to the home of 52-year-old Bob Giesler and his 55-year-old wife, Barbara. The couple had been brutally murdered. Investigators questioned Barbara's son, Brett Harris, who had called 911. After some time, he was able to recount what had happened. Brett said that around 1.30 a.m. he heard a commotion and then a scream coming from his parents' bedroom. When he entered their room, he saw his stepfather standing above his lifeless mother. He saw an ax handle lying on the floor. As he doing? went to grab it, his stepfather then attacked him with a box cutter. Brett said he managed to overpower him and in self-defense, he beat his stepfather to death. The young man was transported to the police station. Evidence technicians made their way into the bedroom. According to crime scene unit investigator Brian Kennedy, both victims had been savagely beaten. Their heads and faces were grotesquely disfigured and uh, there were blood stains all over uh, every surface. Um, at one time, the air must have been filled with atomized mist of, of, or droplets of blood falling out of the air. It was uh, quite a, a horrendous sight. Technicians began looking for evidence to help them reconstruct what had happened inside the room. In addition to the ax handle, investigators also recovered a blood-stained box cutter found resting on Bob Giesler's chest. All of the bloodstain patterns were carefully photographed. As the search of the house continued, officers followed a trail of bloody shoe prints that led from the bedroom to the kitchen. The trail stopped in front of an opened utility drawer. Unsure what to make of the findings, officers created a visual record of the evidence. At the police station, investigators struggled to obtain coherent answers from Brett Harris. He was unresponsive to their questions and began rambling on about the devil and other things that made little sense. Officers photographed several superficial wounds on his body. Police also collected his blood-stained clothes. With so many unanswered questions, police hoped autopsies of the victims could tell them more. The medical examiner concluded that Bob and Barbara Giesler had both died from massive blunt force trauma to the skull. The beatings had been so savage that both the victims' arms had been broken while defending themselves during the assaults. Special Assistant Attorney General David Drewliner followed the investigation. For him, the autopsy findings were troubling. 
the viciousness with which the uh, two individuals were killed, uh, Harris's mother and his stepfather, um, was very extremely similar. And so had, had the stepfather been the killer of, the, of his own wife, and then Harris been the killer of the stepfather, you wouldn't have expected necessarily it to have been uh, in such an identical manner. Authorities couldn't ignore the possibility that one person had committed both murders. If Brett Harris was responsible for the vicious double homicide, investigators needed to find out what could have motivated such rage. They turned to family members for information. Brett's stepsister told detectives that her stepmother and father had always maintained a good relationship with Brett. Though Brett would sometimes find himself facing legal problems, his mother and stepfather would always look out for him, bailing him out of jail on a number of occasions. Brett's stepfather even employed him at his tool-making company in hopes that the young man would find himself. Though Brett suffered from a psychiatric condition, his stepsister said that he had made progress in recent months. And with the help of medications, his prospects for the future were promising. She added that Bob and Barbara's relationship was strong, and she could not imagine that her father would ever hurt her stepmother. Nothing investigators had learned jibed with Brett Harris's version of events. Believing the 24-year-old was hiding something, they turned to examiners at the Sacramento County Sheriff's Crime Lab for answers. There, examiner Brian Kennedy looked to the blood evidence to help him reconstruct the crime. This was an interesting case where we had three people in a house where only one person came out alive, and he had a story. The story was not completely and totally uh, impossible. In piecing it all together, um, I tried to support his story. I actually looked at it to see uh, if I could prove him correct. But in one of the photographs taken in the bedroom, Kennedy noticed something odd. Though the entire room had been saturated with the victim's blood, the carpet underneath the stepfather's body was clean. For Kennedy, there seemed to be only one way to explain that fact. He goes down onto the floor, and he's incapacitated and shields the floor from any blood that would come from his wife. And so we know that he's down first because she's then attacked and her blood covers the rest of the room. And we can, we can put her blood on top of him, but we can't put it underneath him. The finding contradicted Brett's story that his mother had already been bludgeoned and was bleeding by the time he entered the room. With the evidence now pointing to Brett Harris as his mother's killer, Kennedy began analyzing bloodstains on his clothing for proof. But serological tests showed that all the blood on his clothes had originated from the stepfather. Kennedy now wondered if it was possible for Brett to have bludgeoned his mother while avoiding getting her blood on him. To find out, he devised a blood spatter experiment. Simulating the assailant's position, he began striking sponges soaked with blood with a wooden instrument, looking to see how the resulting blood spatter would stain his clothing. The result surprised him. The first couple blows, I actually turned my head to the side of, you know, so I wouldn't get a full face of spatter. And I found out I wasn't getting anything. I just started um, relaxing and letting, letting it go. I started beating it even harder. And it was all going out to the sides. Very little was coming back at me, if any. 
Kennedy had successfully demonstrated that Barbara's assailant could have avoided being spattered by her blood. And coupled with the other findings, it was clear that Brett Harris's story was a lie. So the bottom line is the two deceased people who couldn't speak for themselves spoke volumes with the bloodstain patterns that were produced from them. And I was unable to support or substantiate anything that the defendant had said. After being charged with two counts of first-degree murder, Brett Harris underwent a psychiatric evaluation. He now admitted to both killings, but claimed it was in self-defense. After explaining that his parents were possessed by warlocks, Brett Harris entered a plea of not guilty by reason of insanity. Though Brett had been previously diagnosed with a mental condition, prosecutors believed the story he was now telling was just a desperate attempt to escape justice. He wasn't insane, uh, and by that I mean, uh, did he know what he was doing? Did he know that he actually was killing human beings? And did he know that it was wrong? Uh, and there is no doubt as to the answer to those questions was yes and yes. He knew it was wrong, otherwise, why did he call 911 immediately after it? He knew it was a crime. But to win a murder conviction, Get authorities out. needed to find physical proof that the cold-blooded murders were not the result of an insane mind. Forensic examiners in Sacramento, California, had proven that 24-year-old Brett Harris had brutally bludgeoned his mother and stepfather to death. After being charged with two counts of first-degree murder, the suspect told psychiatrists that warlocks possessed both Bob and Barbara Giesler, and he killed the couple in self-defense. Brett Harris entered a plea of not guilty by reason of insanity. To prove that he was lying in order to avoid the death penalty, authorities turned once again to the forensic evidence. Examiner Brian Kennedy began looking at all the physical evidence recovered from the crime scene, looking for anything that could demonstrate that Brett Harris knew what he was doing at the time of the murders. He focused on the box cutter found on Bob Giesler's chest. After reviewing the autopsy reports, Kennedy believed it was unlikely that the box cutter could have been used as a weapon against Brett, as he had previously claimed. Both of our, our victims had broken arms. If you're defending yourself with your arms and you've got a holding something and it's severe enough to break the arm, you're going to lose control of whatever is in your hand, most likely. I doubt seriously you can hang on to it. For somebody to have their arm broken and then place it on their chest is not likely. Believing that Brett Harris had staged the crime scene to throw investigators off his trail, Kennedy next looked for a way to explain the box cutter wounds found on his body. This looks like somebody has self-inflicted these injuries because they're in the right place. For a right-handed person to cut himself on the left arm, to cut himself on the right cheek, to cut himself from left to right across his chest. So it's all very consistent with staging his own injuries. The forensic findings provided irrefutable proof that Brett Harris had gone to great lengths to conceal his guilt. And for prosecutors, those are not the actions of an insane man. He physically changed the crime scene in anticipation that the police are coming to the crime scene. So he tries to fool law enforcement. Why do it? Why come up with any sort of explanation? He wouldn't have to. Though unsure of the motive, police believe that on October 18, 1984, Brett Harris snuck into the couple's room as they slept in their bed. Using an axe handle, he bludgeoned Bob and Barbara Giesler to death. After finishing the kill, he made his way into the kitchen, sliced himself with a box cutter he took from the utility drawer, 
and returned to the bedroom to plant the evidence. Confronted with the evidence, Brett Harris withdrew his insanity defense. He pled guilty to one count of first-degree murder and one count of second-degree murder. He was sentenced to 41 years to life. Killers skilled at the art of deception hope to confuse investigators by manipulating a crime scene. But forensic experts can find justice for victims of homicide by seeing through a murderer's lies, which are written in tainted blood. Canadian police are on the hunt for a missing woman. Though all indications suggest murder, they must rely on a single strand of animal hair to prove it. When an Ohio woman vanishes, suspicions swirl around her husband. What police lack is hard evidence. In Missouri, a man is found brutally murdered. Doesn't look like it. To catch his killer, police must piece together his final minutes. Sometimes, the murder suspect is immediately apparent, but the proof remains elusive. When there are no witnesses to speak for a victim, forensic scientists must transform the smallest clue into a material witness. Tucked away in the Gulf of St. Lawrence in the southeast corner of Canada lies the remote and sparsely populated Prince Edward Island. On October 7, 1994, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, or RCMP, responded to a complaint about an abandoned vehicle found on private property. When the constable arrived, he discovered the car resting a few hundred yards off a private road no tags were present. 41 to base. A check on the vehicle identification number uh, revealed it was G registered to a woman named Shirley Duguay. Number IG4, AB69. Police arranged to have the vehicle impounded and then began trying to track down the owner. But when the woman failed to return their calls, detectives decided to go to her address. There, they were met by Shirley Duguay's father and her children's babysitter. The news of the abandoned car concerned them. Shirley, they said, had not been heard from in some time. The babysitter said that she last saw the 32-year-old mother of five four days earlier. Shirley was leaving to run some errands. She never mentioned where she was going. She said goodbye and promised to be back in a few hours. For RCMP inspector Alphonse McNeil, the story had raised a troubling question. We wondered why they didn't report her missing. They said that they were concerned that an ex-common-law spouse by the name of Douglas Beamish, who uh, she had had three, the three young children with, would end up getting the children if social services found out that she was missing or gone. So they tried to hold back that information as long as they could, hoping that they would find her. For investigators, the time for waiting was over. Fearing that harm may have come to Shirley Duguay, police processed her abandoned vehicle for clues. What they found was not encouraging. Dozens of tiny reddish-brown stains tested positive for human blood. And barely visible blood stain patterns found on the windshield and larger ones on the seat 
were consistent with having been caused by someone being punched or bludgeoned. There was blood in the vehicle. Shirley Duguay had been missing for four days, so we were concerned that Shirley Duguay had met some form of uh, demise in that vehicle. Investigators returned to the area where the abandoned car had been found. For hours, the search for clues to the young woman's fate turned up nothing. Then, 500 meters from where the car was discovered, investigators found something. It was a pillow stained with what appeared to be blood. And a short distance away lay a blood-stained T-shirt. A shovel was also found nearby. All of the findings pointed to murder. And the shovel led police to believe that Shirley had likely been buried somewhere close by. But a thorough search failed to produce the victim's body. Now, police wanted to speak with the man who had the most to gain from her disappearance her ex-common-law husband and the father of three of her children. Doug Beamish admitted that he and Shirley's relationship had been troubled in the past. And he realized that her family probably blamed him for her disappearance. But he insisted he knew nothing about her. For the sake of the children, he and Shirley had managed to work out their problems. He said he last saw her a week or so earlier. He had been having car problems, and Shirley offered to give him a ride to a job site where he was employed as a construction worker. On the way there, they had a pleasant conversation about their kids and planned to speak more later. She then dropped him off at the site, and the two said goodbye. He hadn't heard from her since. Doug Beamish sensed that something was bothering Shirley. He speculated that she had left town to visit some friends in Toronto. But it turned out that no one there had heard from her in some time. Then police got a call. A woman who had been following the case in the media believed she had important information. This lady called and she said, you know, I remember back around the time that Shirley Duguay went missing, I saw a car similar to hers on a road called the Allen Road, uh, which would be about 20 kilometers away from where we found the car. Uh, I remember it was in the evening, it was, it was dark. I saw two people on the side of the road, uh, a tall man, uh, a very small woman, they appeared to be arguing, and I just went, drove by, and I don't know if it's any good to you or not. The woman couldn't be certain she had in fact seen Shirley Duguay. Still, the information was enough for police to search the area where the caller had seen the couple. But to cover the several square miles, they knew they needed help. Personnel from the Canadian Army agreed to participate in the search. For several days, their efforts turned up nothing. But then, they found something that seemed out of place. One group came across a white plastic bag. We had a police officer with every group of searchers from the military. The police officer seized the bag. The search of the area failed to produce any additional evidence. At the crime lab, examiners carefully removed the contents of the plastic bag. They recovered an old pair of white tennis shoes. There was also a large man's jacket stuffed inside. Several fibers and a single white hair were recovered. But further scrutiny revealed the presence of tiny stains that tested positive for human blood. Based on the information provided by the witness, police believed it had originated from Shirley Duguay. Now they needed to prove it. 
but there was a problem. We didn't have Shirley Dugay, so we needed to be able to develop a DNA profile. The way we did that's what's called, in some cases, reverse paternity. We took a sample from her father, her brother, and her two sons. Though everyone's DNA is unique, a genetic family resemblance exists among blood relatives. When the genetic profiles were compared, examiners concluded that the blood found on all of the evidence had originated from Shirley Duguay. Though the 32-year-old mother's whereabouts remained uncertain, all the evidence suggested she had been the victim of a violent crime. Police on Canada's Prince Edward Island continued searching for missing 32-year-old mother of five, Shirley Duguay. Though efforts to find her had gone unsuccessful, authorities had found clues suggesting she had met with a violent fate. Among them was a man's jacket found stained with blood that had originated from Shirley. Looking for clues as to who might want to harm the young mother, officers from the Royal Canadian Mounted Police questioned Shirley's friends. They all believed that Shirley's ex-husband, Doug Beamish, was somehow involved in the disappearance. Recently, Shirley had started dating again. That had enraged her possessive and jealous ex-husband. And Doug Beamish had a history of violence. But the friend didn't recall if Beamish owned a jacket like the one found with Shirley's blood on it. Doug Beamish was emerging as the prime suspect in Shirley Duguay's disappearance. But so far, investigators had no physical evidence to prove it. You know, without that jacket being able to tie it to someone we're in, we don't have much. Andre, how did you make out with Then the they got a break. We've got something. Eye dancers came back. Uh, they found some white cat hair on the inside of the jacket. And all I could think about all the way down here was Beamish and his white cat in his house. That was all RCMP Inspector Alphonse McNeil needed to hear. We knew that he had a white cat and there were white hairs in the jacket. So um, the process then was to find a lab that could examine these if we were able to seize from blood from the cat. With a warrant in hand, police and a local veterinarian returned to Doug Beamish's house. The suspect continued to deny any involvement in Shirley's disappearance and claimed that he didn't own a jacket like the one stained with her blood. Though it seemed like a long shot, Authorities took possession of his cat, Snowball, hopeful they could somehow establish a genetic link to the hair found on the blood-stained jacket. Blood and hair samples were collected from Beamish's cat. But now, investigators had to find someone who was an expert in analyzing cat DNA. At the National Cancer Institute in Frederick, Maryland, they found one. There, biologist Dr. Stephen O'Brien has looked to the feline genetic code for help in medical research. When contacted, he agreed to help Canadian police. But Dr. O'Brien and his team never imagined that by cracking the feline genetic code, they might also help crack a baffling criminal case. The request to match a cat's DNA was unique in medical and legal history. First, examiners generated a genetic profile of the white hair pulled from the bloody jacket. Once completed, the results were then compared to the profile generated from the samples taken from Snowball. What we discovered was that the genotype was identical to what we had seen in the jacket hair. So we were pretty sure that the jacket hair had come from a cat which had the same genotype as Snowball. Though the scientists felt confident about the results, they could not be absolutely certain of them. It was possible that the few thousand cats roaming on the isolated Prince Edward Island 
shared a common ancestry. To find out, biologists needed to generate more DNA profiles of other cats on the island. We had to determine what the status of the population was so that we could make the calculation of how likely it was that we were wrong in, in, in pronouncing a match. Examiners went to work developing the genetic profiles of 20 randomly selected cats on the island. When O'Brien compared the results, he found that none shared a DNA signature similar to snowballs. In fact, the odds that the hair found on the jacket had not come from Beamish's cat were 45 million to one. Through Snowball, authorities had established a link between Doug Beamish and a jacket stained with his ex-wife's blood. But Inspector Alphonse McNeil wasn't satisfied. Next, he obtained a warrant to collect impressions of the suspect's feet. Now, he hoped to tie the suspect to the pair of white running shoes found with the jacket. We thought, well, if we can put those running shoes on the feet of Douglas Beamish somehow, that would be pretty solid evidence besides his cat. Dr. Keith Bettles, a forensic podiatrist, received the evidence. He began by creating plaster casts of the suspect's feet in order to reveal all of the unique characteristics. People's feet are unique because we walk on them all the time. We have lots of, of different stresses, lots of different forces on our feet. Feet are practically as individual as fingerprints. The casts of Beamish's feet lined up perfectly with all of the wear patterns observed on the insoles of the white shoes. A single strand of cat hair and a discarded pair of shoes had given investigators the evidence they needed to implicate Doug Beamish in the disappearance of his ex-common-law wife. Then, seven months after Shirley Duguay went missing, badly decomposed human remains were discovered buried in a remote wooded area. Hey, how you doing? Oh, pretty good. Dental records later confirmed that the victim was Shirley Duguay. And the medical examiner classified her death as a homicide. A short while later, Douglas Beamish was placed under arrest and charged with first-degree murder. Investigators believe that Beamish couldn't handle Shirley Duguay dating other men. Somehow, he manipulated her into giving him a ride in her car and directed her to a remote spot. Once there, he beat his ex-common-law wife to death. He then buried her body in a remote area and abandoned the car. Douglas Beamish was convicted of second-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison. No place is immune from violent crime. And even the friendliest towns have their problems. Mansfield, Ohio has been called one of America's most livable cities, which makes what happened here all the more surprising. On January 2nd, 1990, a woman came in to speak with Mansfield police. Yes, ma'am, what can I do for you? She was concerned that something had happened to her friend, 44-year-old Noreen Boyle. When she last saw her friend a few days earlier, Noreen was shaken and visibly upset. Her marriage of more than 22 years was falling apart. And not only was her husband moving nearly 200 miles away to Erie, Pennsylvania, but he would likely take the couple's two children with him. Noreen was devastated. When she tried to contact her, Noreen's husband, a prominent local physician, said Noreen had packed up and left town after a fight. One time she said, 
but the friend couldn't believe that Noreen would walk out on her two children. Mansfield police agreed to look into the case. And their first step was to question Noreen's husband, Dr. John Boyle. When Lieutenant David Messmore arrived at the residence, he learned that John Boyle was out of town. John Boyle's mother explained that he had driven to Erie, Pennsylvania a few days earlier, where he was opening up his new medical practice. He was due back later that evening. When questioned, she said that Noreen walked out on the family a few days earlier, and she was watching the couple's children until her son John returned home. The woman excused herself to check on the Boyle's baby daughter. Then, the couple's son approached the detective. My mom would never do something like that. He said he was afraid something bad had happened to his mother. But before he could explain, his grandmother returned. I'm really sorry. I have no more information. When she saw what was happening, she ended the interview and asked the detective to leave. I really have nothing more to tell you. I really need to have you leave. The encounter troubled police. And Lieutenant Messmore couldn't ignore that Dr. Boyle had left town around the same time his wife was reported missing. I'm not sure where it's at. But he soon learned that the reason for the doctor's trip to Pennsylvania checked out. He had been hired by a very large medical corporation in Erie, Pennsylvania. So he was uh, basically traveling back and forth between Mansfield and Erie uh, for some period of time. But where was Noreen Boyle? Later that evening, Detective Messmore returned to the residence. His visit had been anticipated. Dr. Boyle's lawyer oh, answered the door. You, uh, you represent Dr. Boyle? I do. Oh, OK. Uh, is he home right now? Well, his client had in fact difficult. returned home from Pennsylvania. But because of the strain caused by the impending divorce, Dr. Boyle did not wish to discuss Noreen with police. All right, well, I'll, I'll get with you later. It wasn't the response investigators expected. I was somewhat stunned that in the event of a missing person in your family, you would hire an attorney to represent you when uh, there's no accusations or even any allegations of, of uh, wrongdoing or, or even uh, uh, criminal matters involving uh, the family. Uh, so that was certainly a very unusual situ situation. I was not the only to find out what Dr. Boyle might be trying uh, to hide, police know. questioned his friends and co-workers. Professionally, all agreed Dr. Boyle had an impeccable reputation. But personally, he was known to be a womanizer and rumored to be involved in numerous affairs. In fact, one of his alleged mistresses was pregnant. And everyone speculated that the child belonged to Dr. Boyle. Though that made him a bad husband, it didn't mean he was capable of physical violence. In fact, only one person seemed to believe otherwise, and that was the Boyle's son. Concerned for the child's well-being, Lieutenant Messmore caught up with him after school. The child was eager to tell his story. He said that the night before his mom disappeared, the sound of his parents arguing outside his bedroom woke him up. He heard a loud thud, and then there was silence. A few seconds later, his dad peeked into his room. The boy was afraid and pretended to be asleep. The next morning, his mom was gone. His dad told him that she packed up and left. But he didn't believe his mom would leave without saying goodbye. Did, did you have a conversation with your dad at all? Though police had no evidence that a crime had been committed, 
they began to theorize that the noise heard by the child might have been the sound of his own mother being assaulted, or worse. Police in Mansfield, Ohio, continued their search for missing mother of two, Noreen Boyle. And now they theorized that her husband, Dr. John Boyle, was somehow involved. Though police had no hard evidence that a crime had taken place, they were able to obtain a warrant to search the Boyle's Ohio residence. Using luminol, a chemical that reacts to the proteins found in blood, technicians began scouring the house. But their efforts failed to turn up any evidence of a violent crime. Still, investigators persisted. To learn more, they contacted authorities in Erie, Pennsylvania, where Dr. Boyle was setting up his new medical practice. Hi, uh, Mill Creek Township Police Department. Pennsylvania detectives tracked down a real estate agent there who had recently sold a house to Dr. Boyle and a pregnant woman who introduced herself as his wife. She recalled that Dr. Boyle was particularly interested in the home's concrete basement floor. He said he was eager to tear it up in order to build a playroom for his children. He offered to pay the asking price as long as he could take possession of the house immediately. The real estate agent turned over the sales agreement, which was signed by both the doctor and his wife. Pennsylvania authorities forwarded a copy to Mansfield Police Lieutenant David Messmore. In that copy, it was noted that Dr. Boyle signed it, and also an N. Sherry Boyle. And checking further into the background, it was quite obvious that uh, Noreen, uh, Noreen's name was not Sherry uh, for a middle name. Dr. Boyle had purchased the home with a woman pretending to be his wife. Investigators subpoenaed the suspect's most recent credit card statements. They learned that he had used his card to rent a jackhammer and to purchase indoor-outdoor carpeting and a load of concrete. Suddenly, all of the pieces were adding up. I had the feeling and uh, very strong suspicion that uh, the body would be in that location. Pennsylvania authorities issued a warrant to search the basement of Dr. Boyle's new home. Beneath some shelving and the indoor-outdoor carpeting, they found a badly poured patch of concrete. It was roughly the size of a makeshift grave. A crew was called in to dig up the concrete floor. After some time, they recognized the unmistakable smell of a decaying body. Then, a few feet down, they discovered a tarp. And inside were the badly decomposed remains of a human body. After carefully excavating the grave, the remains were transported to the medical examiner's office. A watch and other pieces of jewelry worn by the victim matched the description of those worn by Noreen Boyle. And dental records confirmed that the victim was, in fact, the 44-year-old mother of two. Noreen had been savagely murdered. On January 26, 1990, Almost a month after his wife disappeared, Dr. John Boyle was arrested in Ohio for suspicion of killing Noreen. Despite the evidence against him, the doctor maintained his innocence. Someone was trying to frame him. That seemed ridiculous to investigators. But to ensure a conviction, they needed an eyewitness or physical evidence directly linking him to the homicide. And so far, they had neither. It was possible that Dr. Boyle could get away with murder. 
But then, nearly a week after Dr. John Boyle's arrest, a Mansfield, Ohio resident made a strange discovery. A pile of concrete had been dumped on the remote property. The field was nearly 200 miles away from where Noreen Boyle's body had been unearthed. But the man had followed the case in the media and thought there might be a connection. A crime scene technician was dispatched to the scene. After photographing the area, the concrete was collected into evidence. Police later determined that the property was owned by a close friend of Dr. Boyle's. The doctor had been there on numerous occasions. But to prove murder, police now needed to show that the concrete found in Ohio had originated in the suspect's Pennsylvania home. Police had found missing 44-year-old Noreen Boyle buried in the basement of her husband's new Pennsylvania home. Though investigators had a strong circumstantial case against her husband, they hoped a pile of concrete found in an Ohio field could physically link him to the murder. The samples collected from the field, along with concrete taken from the crime scene, were sent to CTL Engineering in Columbus, Ohio. There, lab supervisor Larry Piscitelli is an expert in analyzing the microscopic nature of rocks and concrete. Without being told where the individual samples had come from, he was asked to determine if any of the concrete pieces had originated from the same source. To analyze the internal structure of the concrete, the samples are cut into cross-sectional pieces using a diamond tip saw. Once completed, the surfaces are smoothed and polished. Then, Piscitelli subjected the evidence to a high-powered microscope. Concrete is a mixture of stones, gravel, and sand, called aggregate, bound together by a cement paste and some trapped air. With the help of a computer, Piscitelli measures and counts each of these components. To the average eye, all concrete looks pretty much alike. But in fact, each chunk has a unique story. Each piece of concrete is usually different because the components vary slightly even if they come from the same load of concrete, two different samples from the same truckload can be different because the uh, percentages of the air voids, the small entrained or entrapped air voids, can be slightly different. Piscitelli was unable to find significant similarities between most of the samples. But when he analyzed the results, he found that two of the pieces stood out from the rest. they shared the exact same number of unique components. These two pieces of concrete had some unique characteristics that were peculiar just to those two pieces of concrete. And based on all the data and analysis, the numbers being exactly the same, I was able to show that those two pieces of concrete came from the same structure. Of the two samples that matched, one had come from the pile of rubble found in Mansfield, Ohio. The other was collected in the basement of the suspect's new home in Erie, Pennsylvania. Police now had enough to charge Dr. John Boyle with murder. Police believe that John Boyle murdered his wife in the couple's home in order to start a new life with his pregnant mistress. After the kill, he drove her body to Pennsylvania and buried her in a grave he had dug in the basement of his new home. Investigators theorize he then returned to Ohio and dumped the leftover concrete on his friend's property. Dr. John Boyle was convicted of aggravated murder and abuse of a corpse.
he was sentenced to 20 years to life. John Boyle thought he'd buried all evidence of his crime. But in fact, the trail of evidence spanned 200 miles. Other murders are more local, but the road to solving them can be just as long. In Harrison County, Missouri, on June 26, 1995, a farmer out for a walk noticed a foul odor. At first, he thought that maybe one of his livestock had died. But the reality was much worse. Hidden among some overgrowth lay the lifeless body of a man. After receiving the 911 call, dispatchers contacted officers of the Major Case Squad, a group of law enforcement personnel from several neighboring jurisdictions. Bethany Police Chief George Martz was among the first to respond to the scene. We had no idea when we arrived who the victim was. Uh, th there was no identification on the body that we were able to determine at that time. But the manner in which he died was clear. He had been shot several times. Police recovered an empty box of ammunition. And a few feet away, they found several spent shotgun shell casings. Then, Sheriff Greg Kuhn from the nearby Grundy County Sheriff's Department arrived at the location. He believed he recognized the victim as a local resident by the name of Al Pinniger. After I looked at the body, uh, I felt that it might have been uh, Al Pinniger, who uh, I had dealt with in the past uh, in Grundy County. Uh, really couldn't tell for sure, but it just appeared to me that might be who it was. Unsure what was evidence and what was roadside trash, investigators collected numerous items scattered around the area. They found and collected a small plastic clock. On the back was torn adhesive with tiny synthetic fibers clinging to it. They also located a single strand of brown leather lying in the middle of the road. Police hoped that somewhere among the debris were clues that could explain this brutal murder. At autopsy, the medical examiner confirmed that the victim had died as a result of several 12-gauge shotgun blasts. He'd been shot twice in the back and once in the face. The victim's fingerprints were lifted and then passed on to Harrison County Police. Investigators requested Al Pinniger's fingerprint card, which was on file in Grundy County. When they compared those prints with the ones taken from the homicide victim, they found a perfect match. Now, detectives from the major case squad had to figure out who wanted Al Pinniger dead. Major case squad. Soon, they got their first break. Okay, when did she report him missing? Police learned that the victim had been reported missing a few days before his body was discovered. Okay, thanks for calling. And the report had been filed by his fiancée. Police immediately arranged for an interview. The victim's fiance told detectives that she and Al had been living together for some time. She said that she last saw him a few hours before he went missing. She had left the house to go run a few errands. Al said he was going to cut the grass and do some work around the house. He hadn't mentioned any plans to leave that day. Recently, she had been trying to help him overcome a drug problem. He had been doing his best to stay far away from his drug-dealing friends. She suspected, however, 
that he had seen some of them that day. When she returned home later that afternoon, she passed a pickup truck coming out of her neighborhood. She didn't see Al in the truck, but she knew the vehicle belonged to a couple that he used to deal drugs with. So he's been dealing with drugs? She believed Al may have been ducking down to avoid being seen. When the fiancé arrived home, she discovered that Al and his 12-gauge shotgun were gone. The information provided police with their first real lead. They ran a background check on the couple, identified as John Middleton and his girlfriend, Maggie Hodges. Middleton had an extensive criminal record, mostly involving drug-related offenses. To find out why he may have wanted to harm Al Pinneger, police tracked down Middleton's known associates. One informant described Middleton as an extremely unstable and violent person. Hodges and Middleton. He said that as a result of police efforts to crack down on local drug dealers, John Middleton had become increasingly paranoid. He threatened to kill people he did business with if he found out they were cooperating with authorities. No one doubted him for a minute. Everyone was afraid of him. All of the information led police to suspect that Middleton's paranoia had likely led to the murder of Al Pinneger. And they hoped that somewhere among the shotgun shells and the assorted litter collected from the crime scene was the means to prove it. Police in Harrison County, Missouri, believed that a local drug dealer and his girlfriend were responsible for the brutal shotgun slaying of 29-year-old Alfred Pinneger. To prove it, investigators needed to physically link the suspects to the crime scene. Though several potential clues had been found there, an empty box of shotgun shells looked to be the most promising lead. A price sticker found on the box led investigators to the store where the ammo had originated. An employee there pulled recent sales records. According to receipts, several boxes of shells were bought on the day of the murder. The clerk recalled that two men and a woman had come in together to make the purchases. She also remembered something else. A few hours after the purchase, two of the three customers returned to the store. They had unused cartridges and wanted to return them for a refund. The clerk didn't recall seeing the other man who had been in with them earlier. When shown photographs, she picked out Al Pinneger, John Middleton, and Maggie Hodges as the three who bought the boxes of ammo earlier that day. Did she come back the second time? Um, yeah. And she identified Middleton and Hodges as the two who came back to return the unused ammo. Though the evidence didn't prove murder, it was enough for police to obtain arrest warrants. Believing that Middleton and his girlfriend were capable of great violence, police cautiously approached the house they shared together. John Middleton was quickly subdued. Moments later, Maggie Hodges was also taken into custody. After the suspects were removed from the scene, police began searching for proof of murder. Inside Middleton's pickup truck, they collected a fringed brown leather jacket. As the search continued, technicians found a potential clue. Bethany Police Chief George Martz. We took a 
piece of the dashboard from the Middleton truck that had uh, a sticky substance on it and on that sticky sub substance were fibers. Uh, those fibers appeared to match the clock we found at the crime scene. So we removed a piece of the dash, the entire dash, and uh, sent that to the lab for uh, analysis. All of the evidence was forwarded to the Missouri State Highway Patrol Crime Lab located in Jefferson City. There, criminalist Kathleen Green worked the case. Almost immediately, she noticed that the fringes on the brown leather jacket appeared identical to a piece of brown leather found at the crime scene. I looked at the jacket to see if there was any fringe missing from it and did find an area where there was a piece of fringe missing. I then compared the question end of the fringe to the question area on the jacket to determine if, they, if it was originally attached to it. Though the pieces lined up well, Green was unable to conclusively state that the piece of leather had in fact come from Middleton's jacket. She turned her attention to the stick-on clock found near Al Pinniger's body. When she compared the adhesive on the back of the clock to the adhesive stuck to Middleton's dashboard, she found numerous similarities. It was the same size, it had the same coloring. They were both made of the same type of material. When the torn edges of the two pieces were placed side by side under a comparison microscope, examiners found a match. Next, fibers found on the stick-on clock were compared to carpet samples collected from the vehicle. Criminalist Jenny Smith found one consistency after another. We determined that the fiber from the clock face, this would have been considered the question fiber, was similar in um, physical and chemical composition to the fiber from the suspect vehicle. Therefore, we would conclude that this fiber, question fiber, could have come from this vehicle. When confronted with the evidence, Middleton was uncooperative. This is your opportunity to tell your side. But his resistance didn't matter. Police had pieced together the motive behind the murder. Think about this for a while. My belief is that Mr. Middleton thought Alfred Pinniger was about to rat him out to the police department and to law enforcement authorities, uh, and Mr. Middleton was not going to allow that to happen. You're in some bad trouble. But Middleton was wrong. The victim had made no attempt to contact authorities. Police believe that on the day of the murder, John Middleton and Maggie Hodges drove to Al Pinniger's house. They asked him to go target shooting, and he agreed. What he didn't know was that he was the intended target. At some point, however, that became clear. A scuffle started inside the car. Pinniger escaped, but he didn't get far. John Middleton was convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to death. Maggie Hodges pled guilty and was sentenced to 50 years in prison. It takes motive and opportunity to commit a murder. And it takes hard evidence to solve one. When clues are few, forensics experts provide the know-how to turn the most ordinary object into a material witness.